<laughs> hey, make sure you invite somebody. We've got invite cards on your way out. If you know somebody who probably needs to know Jesus, God's probably knocking on the door of their heart. Give them an invite card and invite them to Easter. Welcome today. I want to welcome you guys. Welcome to the Oasis. Yes, do you love Jesus? Let's give him a hand clap because, you know, that's all we got today. Hey, if you're, the first, if you're a first-time guest with us today, make sure you grab a Connect card and let us know about that. We'd love to just say hi and drop you a note. Want to get started with a video. What, some coffee? Can I make regular hazelnut? Mm -hmm. Or do you want some cinnamon hazelnut? <laughs> That's the time out. Yep, time out. Yep, you kick the table. Time out. Doesn't that hurt your knees? Yep, time out. You kick the table. I don't want to stick I won't do that anymore. Well, go and time out for a minute. <laughs> you need to go take a deep breath. No. <laughs> go ahead. Just a minute. <laughs> go ahead. For a minute. Anna, what do you think of all of this? <laughs> Isn't that so hilarious? When it's not your kid? <laughs> Why do kids throw tantrums, temper tantrums? Why is that? You know, when they don't get their way. And I believe that kids act exactly how adults want to act when they don't get their way. And we absolutely freak out and lose our minds. You heard about, if you're a parent here, you know about the terrible twos. You know why the terrible twos happen, right? The terrible, when a kid's two years old, that's about the time when they start learning that, you know what, the world doesn't revolve around you, child, and they freak out. That's why it's so terrible. But that kind of leads us into what we're going to talk about today. I'm glad the video's running because you just can't get into this today unless we have something like that. Hey, if you got your Bibles, open in your Bibles to the book of... Yes, we have been looking at the book of Job. Uh, we've been using this verse as our theme verse throughout this series, Job chapter 42, verse 12, that says that the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. And we've talked about how to live a blessed life like Job, even when Job's life was falling apart. We talked about how Job is a story of hope because God did indeed bless his life because in week number one we looked at Job never gave up on a God that never gave up on him. In week number two, we looked at stop making excuses and start making a difference. Week number three, we talked about how God has ownership, we have stewardship, and how we're going to be blessed when we handle finances God's way. Week number four, we talked about how Job was willing to seek and surrender to the voice of God, and he didn't rebel against what God was speaking into his life. Last week, we talked about getting past the performance trap. And today, we're going to talk about, if we want to be blessed, I've got to understand that it's not about me. It's not about me. So I want today just to kind of get into this a little bit more. And I want you guys just to say out loud on the count of three that it's not about me. One, two, three. It's not about me. Well, you know, that's real good. I was, I'm surprised by that. You guys are, you know, with it today. Now what I want you to do, and this might even be better. I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to say, it's not about you on the count of three. One, two, three. It's not about you. There's something freeing about that, isn't it? Especially if you're a husband and wife or a child and parent. Just to be able to say, hey, it's not about you. If we want to live a blessed life, today's lesson, it's not about me. And here's what's fascinating. We live in a culture today that breeds this at a young age into our kids. In fact, let's carry the child analogy just a little bit further. I, before we moved out west uh, over two years ago, my, my girl's five now, so this was before she was three. We... Uh, we can't, this is the first time that I experienced this, but we went to this, we went to this birthday party. And uh, the, there's crazy things that happen at birthday parties these days. We went to this birthday party, you know, it was probably the first kid birthday party I'd been to since I was a kid. 
we go there and, and we go and, and my, we're, we go and we give this kid a gift. And, and this kid, everybody got a gift. Every kid at this party got a gift. And I'm like, well, when I was a kid, I went and I gave a gift. I didn't get a gift. What's going on right here? And I asked my wife, I said, what are they doing? They're giving this, these gifts to these kids. What's going on? And uh, I remember my wife saying to me, well, you know, <laughs> kids get upset these days when they go to a party, a birthday party, and this one kid gets a gift and nobody else gets a gift. I said, don't ever do that if we have a party for my child. So we've never had a party. <laughs> now, I, I don't know how that's translated. I hope she's listening to my advice. But what are we doing in our culture? We're teaching everybody at a young age. It's all about you. If you don't get a gift, get mad, throw a tantrum. And we grow up with that. And you know what? Let's transition that to the life of Job. Job. Job understood quickly in his life that there is this world outside beyond his troubles. Now, seriously, he was going through some troubles, but he had to understand, and I think this was God's lesson that he was teaching him, that Job, it's not about you. And in Job chapter 1 and 2, we saw how his life fell apart. I mean, completely shattered. Lost all of his kids, lost all of his flocks and his herds, his, God, his wife's upset with him. I mean, his health breaks, everything falls apart. Then his friends show up and they're these legalistic guys say, Job, you got some sin in your life. And then in chapter 38 of the book of Job, we saw that God showed up. And this is what God's conversation was completely about to poor Job. It was, Job, look, I want you to know it's not about you. I want to look at, at verse 38 and some passages and kind of draw this out a little bit. And explain this a little bit further. Chapter 38, verse 1. The Bible says this. We've read this before in the series. It says that the Lord answered Job out of the storm. And he said, you know, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. You know, you remember that? You know, gird up your loins. I will question you, Job, and you shall answer me. Now, now stop right real quick. Job's got to be going, God has arrived God is going to speak to me. Listen to this. God's going to, God, I want to get my Bible out. I want to get my notes. I want to get my iPad out. I want to take some notes here because God is going to explain to me the reason for my troubles. It's what, what's wrong with my life. I get to listen to God speak to me. Verse 4 goes on. God starts talking to Job. Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me. If you understand, who marked off its dimension? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Okay, God, I, you know, I'm writing this down, but what's this got to do with what's going on in my life right now? I mean, the dimensions? I mean, are you serious here? Look at verse 16. Jump over to there in chapter 38. God just keeps talking. Job keeps writing. Have you journeyed, Job, to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the shadow of death? God, come on, time out. I'm on an IV here. I'm about to die. What are you talking about? Walk to the, to the recesses of the deep. How can I get? I'm sick, God. What's that got to do with me? Verse 18. Have you comprehended the vast expanse of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. I don't know all this, God. I mean, Job's waiting for some information. Tell me what's going on with my life. Why am I struggling here? Why is, I have I lost everything in my health? What is going on? Flip over to chapter 39 and look at the first couple of verses there. God just keeps talking. I mean, keep writing, Job. I'm telling you what's going on. Chapter 39, verse 1. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? God, goats? Serious? Come on, give birth. What are you talking about, God? Look down to verse 40 now, 40 over to the verse 15. God just keeps talking. And you've got to imagine Job's in, in confusion here. Look at the behemoth which I made along with you and which feeds on the grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. Okay, God. I don't know what's going on. I don't even know what a behemoth is. I'll have to like Google that to figure out what's going on here. What's this got to do with me? We, we read through this, this discourse where God's just laying it on Job. And Job's trying to figure this out. And, and Job's going, this has nothing to do 
with my life. God, what are you saying to me? And when you stay, take a step back from the text and look at this whole conversation with God, what God is telling to Job, I firmly believe here, is that Job, it's not about you. The world is a lot bigger than you. Stop worrying about what's going on in your life. Look, I've got the goats and the behemoth. I've got the whole universe in my hand, Job. And when you stop focusing on the size of your problems, and you start focusing on the size of me, Job, you're going to see that some things are a little bit different when you put it in that perspective. Because, Job, it's not about you. And if we can wrap our minds around that in our own life, when we have those, our own troubles and trials in our life, when we can wrap our minds around it's not about me, we can live a blessed life like Job. Now let's take this message of Job and translate that over to some communication that Jesus gave on one occasion in Matthew chapter 22. There was, there, last week we talked about legalism. These guys in Jesus' day were some legalists. There were some like 600 plus laws. They stacked laws on top of laws and said, hey, you got to live like this. And this guy came and asked Jesus, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? You know, can you just boil it down? Give me something tangible that I can live my life by? And Jesus gives this information. I mean, it's a legit question. In chapter 22, beginning with verse 37, Jesus gave an answer to what's this greatest command. And Jesus replied this, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor. As yourself. And Jesus said, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So who are we to love? We're to love God. And who, what's the next thing? It says we're to love our neighbor as ourself. It doesn't say anything about, hey, you're, you need to love yourself because it's all about you. No, God says the furthest thing from that. We're to love God and love people around us. He's not focusing on self. And I think we can live a blessed life like Job when we step back and understand how big God is and we focus on God and loving God and loving others and we take that focus off of self. So I want to look at three areas of focus today that I think when we focus on these areas that God can remove us a little bit from the picture and we can get over the hurdles that we may face right now or may face in the future as we go down this pathway of life. And the first is the church. The church. God gave us, I believe, one of the functions of the church is that when we see what our role is in the church, that the, that function teaches us that we are to get past ourself. We are to get past self. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said this, I tell you, to Peter, this is after Peter gave the good confession. I tell you that on this rock I will build my church. My church, Jesus said, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Now, who does the church belong to? It belongs to Jesus Christ. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. So the church is extremely important. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, and that is going to prevail. <clears throat> and I want you to know I love my church. I mean, I believe this church is awesome. I love it when I hear others talk about, I love my church. I love my church. <laughs> Amen. Uh, I had a, a couple in, in my office last week, and they had uh, attended for the first time recently to the Oasis. And, and they were going through about such, uh, how they had such a positive experience. I mean, from the time they walked through the door, came in here to worship and walked out, what a positive experience that was. And I said to them, I said, I love my church. And you know, I don't think people uh, normally hear that today, especially when a preacher says, I love my church, because, you know, cult. Everybody starts thinking, you know, what, what are they doing there <laughs> that they love their church? But, and people think that's weird, you know, and people don't think it's weird. I think this is what's funny, and I mentioned this before about we can talk about our favorite band or, or, or music, and we can talk about that with passion, and people don't think that's weird. And you know, out here, out west, I'm from the Midwest, and, and you talk about, it's March Madness. I mean, people freak out, and, and they don't here. You know, I, I'm from, uh, from Kentucky, and I mean, March Madness is going on. So it's nothing to talk about your favorite basketball, college basketball team. I mean, I had, I had a friend of mine, I mean, get this, just, pay, just, just close your eyes for a second. I had a friend of mine send me a video 
of these, these two guys singing my old Kentucky home, standing in the center of Rupp Arena. I mean, it, brought a, it almost brought a tear to my eye, man. <laughs> I, mean, that's all, I mean, when you're a Kentucky fan, you know what that means. I mean, did you see Kentucky? Did you see Kentucky beat, uh, who'd, who'd they beat? Florida, yeah, and, and Louisville. They beat Notre Dame. I mean, Kentucky was on top uh, yesterday. I mean, that's okay. I, you know, people don't think you're weird. Uh, maybe people out here do when you're talking about <laughs> college basketball. But man, we eat that up. But for some reason, when you say, I love my church, people think that's weird. And I'm telling you that we need to love our church because Jesus gave his life for the church. And he loves his church. And if you love the church, I want to ask you a question this morning. And what I want to ask is, why do you love the church? Do you love the church because of what it does for you? Or do you love the church because you know that God is shaping you through his church, making you a transformed person as you follow Jesus Christ? People can view the church in two extreme ways. One, they, they can view the church as a restaurant, or they can view the church as a family. Right? I mean, you think about a restaurant. What's a restaurant got to have to be a good restaurant? It's got to have good food, good service, and good coffee. If it doesn't have good coffee, it's not a good restaurant. I mean, you know, you might as well go somewhere else. But, but I, I love good service. You know, you, you, you walk into a restaurant, you want to be served well. And that's one of the telltale signs of, of a good restaurant. And, and I like to tip well. You know, and, and uh, I just want to roll that out there. And you know, some people, that, well, I didn't get good service. You know, I'm not going to tip well if I don't get good service. Think about the server. I mean, that server uh, may have just gotten a phone call that their child is sick if it's lunchtime. They're trying to, you know, you didn't get your coffee filled up because they're in the back trying to make arrangements for their kid to come home from school or something. You don't know if they had an argument before they came in. There's a lot that goes on in the life of a server when, when, they, when they don't serve well. I like to tip well. Um, when I go to, I like good service. But I, I mean, I, in graduate school, I lived off tips. So I know uh, p servers live off tips. So, I mean, if, if you're still not with me on this, you know, service kind of thing and tipping well, uh, just think about this. If you think, well, my server didn't deserve it. Uh, imagine if God gave us what we deserved. You know, that kind of puts things in perspective. But anyway, that's just kind of a tipping thing. But uh, I enjoy tipping well. But, but I, love getting, I, get, I love getting served well. You know what I mean? I love it when my, my coffee's filled up and I don't have to ask about that and it doesn't get cold. I love it if, if I have a salad, it gets pulled up and they're bringing the meal and it's hot. It's the way that you ordered it and everything is, is, is just right, you know. If the server came along... And, and like, you know, when, when you're done with your meal and the, the plates just disappear and you don't even know, you know, where did the plates go? You know, you good conversation, good service. And, but, but what if the server came and said, hey, Pastor Greg, you know, uh, could you help me? You're, you're done with the meal. Do you mind packing those dishes up to the dishwasher? I'd say, no, I'm tipping you well. What are you talking about? You know, it's crazy. You don't want to get carried. But anyway, another reason to tip well, you know, uh, uh, People might know where you go to church. And, uh, you know, you could do a real disservice to Jesus. <laughs> but I remember back in graduate school, we had, a, we had the Baptist convention every year. And uh, the servers hated it when the Baptists came to town for an entire week. They filled the restaurants and nobody tipped. Now, nothing, nothing against Baptists or anything. I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> that was the impression. So tip well. Anyway, you get it. So a restaurant. You can view the church as a restaurant. But a family's different. I mean, think about your family. Think about my family when we have a meal. What's a, what's a meal like? We, we serve one another. We don't sit down to be served. You know, we, we set up the table together. We, we set that sometimes by five-year-olds. She'll get the napkins folded in silverware. And, and we're looking at what's not on the table. And, and we're making sure, hey, do you got the plate? Yeah, do you got the baby? Yeah, where is the baby? You know, and you get in there. And, and we, get, we get everything on the table. And we, we sit down finally and huffing and puffing. And, and we hold hands and we pray. And when we pray, we eat like a family. We, we eat with our hands, some of us. We talk with our mouth open. I mean, it's home. I mean, this is our family. It's messy. I mean, it's still messy, especially the baby's coming to the table now. And, 
and wanting to eat and, and throw everything across the table as well. We pick up after ourselves. We just don't leave. Somebody's got to pick that up. We don't have a server that comes along. We're serving one another. We're going back and forth from the table to the kitchen, the table to the fridge. And I love it when mom's there because she's at the sink washing everything we don't put in the dishwasher. I mean, it's awesome. But we serve one another. We serve each other. And it's great when we serve each other. And a church that does that will be blessed because we understand that it's not about me and we're serving one another. So do you view your church as a restaurant or a family? Did you walk through the doors today and evaluate how well you were served? Or did you walk in here and think about how you could serve? Because this is something I know about you. If you walked in here evaluating how well you were served, this is what I know about you. You think that it's all about you. And if you walked in here today and you served, I want to thank you because you know that Jesus Christ gave his life for you. And you know what it's about, that, Lord, you have empowered me, you have blessed me, you have forgiven me, you have equipped me to serve other people. And that's what it's about because I know it's not about me. 1 Peter 4.10 says, each one, and that's us, each one should use whatever gift he has received. Why? To serve others. To serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. The church is just one way, I believe, that God is teaching us, I have equipped you. I am commissioning you. I am using you to love me and to love others, to serve other people in the local church. And if you don't, you're missing out. So get involved. If you're not involved, get involved. Because we're not a restaurant. We're a family. And that's why I love my church, because I think we get that. The church. Point number two. The community. The community. I believe that God uses the community to teach us that it's not about me. And listen, I love this church. It's a great church. God has called us to a new location with this new building. Isn't that awesome that one day that we're going to be, I think we're going to have a great opportunity in a new building to reach out in our community. Why is that? Because I believe that the way we do church makes a difference in people's lives. The conduit of God into people's lives. But you know, it's not just what happens. In this place, at the, in the new place, inside those walls, Jesus didn't call us just to gather every Sunday morning and to isolate ourselves from other people. He didn't come down and say, hey, you know what, we need to pull yourselves out of, the, out of the world and we just huddle together in this holy huddle and think that we're doing God's purpose in our life. God didn't intend for us to isolate ourselves ourselves and he has used the community I think to teach us that it's not about me in John 17 15 Jesus said this my prayer is not that you take them out of the world but that you protect them from the evil one God has called us to impact our community and there are several ways that we do that OCC or the Oasis Christian Church we got this this meaning for this, an acronym that says it's for outreach, connect, and contribute. That's part of the mission. That's part of our strategic plan to go out and to outreach into our community. Okay, I mean, can you imagine if we each introduced one person to Christ by the end of this year, how that would impact this church and our community? And one of the greatest ways that we serve this community, one of the greatest ways is the fact that we don't reinvent the wheel. We have partnered and are partnering with different ministries in our community to be able to reach out and to serve in our community in a variety of ways. And sometimes we have given financially to these organizations. Sometimes we have sent people to these organizations. And when we do that, when we get outside of these walls and start serving our community the way God intended, we learn to realize it's not about me. And if you've got a specific passion <coughs> in ministry, then you need to get involved in that. You can communicate with us about that. I'm guessing that there's probably not an organization in our community that's already not doing something that we could possibly dream up to do. So check those things out. I mean, we have people in community outreach here that serve 
at the ACPC, a caring pregnancy center, for example. Uh, we have sent people there before that have been able to counsel uh, young teens that have been pregnant. We right now ha are helping them financially with the baby bottle campaign. Several of you I know have participated in that where you get one of these baby bottles out there and fill that up with change. They have determined that it takes $1,200 per, uh, per donation to, to save a life in this county, uh, $1,200. So we participate in that. It's very exciting. We, another organization, I mentioned it a while back, Wayside Cross Mission, uh, Kevin Steenbergen preaches there. We have, because of the generosity of your gifts, have been able to support the Wayside Cross, the, the homeless mission in Pueblo financially already this year because of what you guys have given. And if you have an interest, we, we're not to sit here in a holy huddle. We just don't serve inside these walls. We are to impact our community. If you have something that you want to do, we can probably help direct you to that. If, you, if you're interested in doing something like that, we got help at the Oasis CC up on, on the screen. Write that down and uh, send us, you know what, area of interest and see if we can partner and, and send you as a part of the church to help one of these organiz organizations that's doing the work of the church. So, so we take, we kind of piggyback on what others are doing. Our connect groups, our in-home Bible study fellowship groups is the primary way right now and as we move into the future of how we plan on impacting our community for the cause of Christ. If you're not familiar with our connect groups, we have three semesters of connect groups that go year round. They're about 13 weeks with about 10 to 13 weeks with about four to six weeks off in between. We're about three weeks into our spring semester right now. And uh, we just sent information out, by the way, uh, to our connect groups. And, and we want to encourage our groups to do in-reach and outreach because we know that we weren't made to do life together. That's why we have these groups that meet through the week so we don't do life alone, so we just don't worship together here on the Lord's Day on Sunday. And when we embrace that concept that we don't do life alone, we're able to serve and do and impact our community in ways like we're not able to. And we, we, we communicated with our connect groups last week to make sure you're, you're getting your inReach project done. What's inReach? Well, it's what we do everything inside the walls, right? I mean, we got tons of setup, tons of breakdown <coughs> that we do here. Even if this is your first time with us, some, some of it's not that organized. So when we, you dismiss, get to know somebody, pick up a chair, you know, carry a piece of furniture. I mean, get into the game. Get off the side. That's in reach. And uh, we're going to have a new building before long. I mean, we thought, hey, we're going to get a break from chairs, but we're going to have to clean floors and, and toilets. I mean, there's going to be plenty of in-reach. But you do that as a part of your group. And it's just, it's just a blast. I mean, it's great serving together. Outreach. What's outreach? You know, we, we don't tell any group what to do. We just encourage the group as a team, as a group of people who know each other to get out there, get outside the walls, be creative, and do something in the community. And it is awesome what some of our groups have done and plan on doing. And we had a group last semester that, that went to, I think it was last semester, went to the Church of Christ. That's where our youth group meets weekly on Thursday night. And we've used the, the Church of Christ just up the road here for different meetings. The, one of the groups, they have fellowship meals, went and prepared and served a meal to the people at the Church of Christ. I mean, that's outside our walls. That's awesome. That is, that's outreach. We had a, a few go uh, to uh, El Pueblo, the, the children's home. And, and, you know, everybody pitched in at Christmas time, and we bought over 100 gifts for, for kids. And we had groups go, and, and they had this party, and Santa Claus was there, and they brought the house down because these groups went out and loved on these kids. And that organization thought this church was awesome. And they glorified Jesus Christ because that was awesome. We try to support the schools in this community. We do the, the coat drive every year. And we participate that. And we want to partner more with the schools and just pour our outreach into the needy among us in the school systems e even here. In fact, we're doing the Hoot Nanny coming up. And I know there's several groups that are going to participate in that. It's at this school, their fundraiser. 
And, and we're going to have a team of people serving. And, and they, they, they come in and buy tickets. We're donating food probably to the tune of over $900 as a church just to help this school because they've helped us for seven years in providing a place of worship for, the, for us for this church. Our connect groups are awesome. Why is that? Because save people serve people. Save people serve people. And you imagine if we were able to double the people sitting inside these walls, the impact that we would have in the future outside these walls. And I don't want, to, I don't want a church that's impassioned with seating capacity. I want a church that's impassioned with sending capacity because that's what Jesus Christ called us to do in the church and we can only do that when we learn that it's not about me it is about taking the gospel to the world about us in our community and you know what the more you give the more you receive and the only way that the Oasis is going to make a difference in this community is when you as an individual as a group go out and you make a difference in this community for the cause of Jesus Christ. The community. The world. The world. We can understand better, I think, when we can wrap our arms around that, when we step back and we look at the opportunities where we can serve in the world. Jesus said this, and it's not a suggestion. He said in Mark 16, Go into the world, preach the good news to all creation. Go into all the world. Jesus said this to a group of men who didn't have airplanes, who didn't have cars, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have email, they, didn't, they couldn't tweet. Can you, I mean, he told this to a group of 12 guys who had incredibly limited resources to go into all the world. I mean, what an overwhelming task. We're 2,000 years later and he's telling us to do that. Go into all the world. What kind of responsibility do you think that he has on us? when we have all the capabilities and the resources that we have in America today, <clears throat> don't you think he's probably caused us, called us to do so much more? And God is allowing, I believe, this church to learn that it's not about me as we see the opportunities that are around us. And I want to highlight a couple of those right now. We are right now, uh, Lifeline Christian Mission is a mission. Uh, you can check them out at lifeline.org. It is a mission that, that goes throughout the world. It's a great, solid organization that sends teams of, of missionaries all throughout the world and even in our locality. One of the things that we're looking to do this year, if we can figure it out, is how to send our youth group. And we need youth sponsors to do that. Down to Arizona, they, they go to the Navajo Nation down there. And uh, they've got a school and they've got a church there. We're going to watch a video that just kind of illustrates some of the work that they do. So if we can roll that and get a get a taste for what they're doing down there. The purpose of the, the Red Sands Christian School here at Navajo Trails is to uh, reach out to the Navajo children on the reservation as well as Winslow all the way around. And our goal is to not only provide them with a quality education but also teach them about Jesus Christ. Um, the school, Don Springer, has been here for I think over 20 years now, and she has been instrumental in keeping the school running and growing. And with the school, uh, we've been able to hire two Navajo teachers to assist in teaching at the school. And that's something, again, we want to be able to find a way to make the school absolutely incredible being under Lifeline's direction. Uh, we're going to seek accreditation, we're going to seek more teachers, and if we can find more Navajo teachers and be able to continue in the Navajo cultural education as well as just a great overall uh, public education we want to be able to do that as as best we possibly can hi my name is Dawn Springer and I have been out here 20 years it's, I love teaching I love when they begin and, and you tell their parents that they're going to be reading and, and their parents look at you like you are just really crazy and then the first time they figure out a word and how to read it and I just enjoy the learning process one of my rewards is um, former students who come back to see me or who uh, send me graduation invitations and that's from when they were in kindergarten in my classroom a long time ago. It's, uh, it's not always easy, sometimes it's difficult, 
but I call them God smiles. I get a lot of God smiles. They got mission groups going all throughout the summer uh, that that are helping. They're they're doing some rebuilding of some buildings, and they go in and minister to the people there, to the Navajo people, and take Jesus and impact. and And it's awesome. I mean, if you ever get an opportunity, uh, you, you got to do at least one mission trip in your life. It might be going to Arizona. I mean, it might be going to Central Kentucky. No joke. I mean, I've been to Central Kentucky on mission trips. It might be somewhere overseas. You need to take an opportunity to do that. It's costly, but I tell you what, when you do that, there's, n there's no other way to understand that it's not about me than when you get into some impoverished areas and you see how people crave the love of Jesus Christ. Um, there's another mission organization I want to highlight. Uh, I met a fellow who came and spoke to the area ministers about what they're doing in Serbia. And uh, I kind of resonated with what he is planning to do uh, with, with the former Campus Crusade. It's called Crew now. And, and we've already taken, I've already taken some personal steps in supporting his ministry. And uh, just, just picture yourself going on a mission trip and talking about Jesus, about how you love your church and what God has done in your life and having that impact somebody on the other side of the globe. We're going to watch a video testimony of somebody's life who has changed because of somebody. I was born in, in Bosnia and when war in Bosnia started I came in Serbia and we were in refugee camps. During that time my parents divorced and my dad is still in Bosnia but my mom and my sister will live here. I'm raised in in Orthodox family and my mom always she tried to teach us about God and um, she, and from the beginning it was for me it was just a list of do, do's and don'ts and um, I didn't realize what what is how is that important for me and uh, we were in in refugee center here in Serbia when we came and People from England, they came and they, they taught about how Jesus loves us. And for me, in that time, that was not my faith. That is something weird and I refused that. But when I finished school, I started to think about life, purpose of life. And some, somehow I rejected God like because of everything that I need to do to gain His love. and. I started to remember what people from England talking me about and about his love, about how he did everything. And I found the church and went there and it was for me like this is the end of my searching, like for something to fill my soul. And I realized that nothing that I can do can, cannot please him enough and that Jesus did everything. So I just accept that. When you like uh, try to to speak about spiritual things, a lot of of people think like you are from America, I'm from Serbia. That is different cultures. That is different churches. Like a lot of people, they think that maybe God hates us, or maybe I don't know, because we are a poor country, and you know. I hope that He will change. Uh, heart from like from re resisting like he changed my heart from resisting him or like have some kind of weird thinking about him that he doesn't love us to thinking that he will change like hearts here th that people knows that God loves them that they 
believe in that and they live that. And I know that that is the only way to make this society better. People all over the world in the same condition, lost without Christ. There are people in the walls of churches today that are lost without Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, what I wanted to present a picture today of is what I think what God was saying to Job. Job, it's not about you. And the world, I, I hold the whole world in my hands, and I have created each of you for on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose, and that is specifically to love me, God is saying, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And that means we get beyond ourselves and we tell other people about the amazing grace and love of God our Father who sent His one and only Son. And that's the message of the gospel today. Would you pray with me? Father, you have, through the Chronicles of Scripture, Father, you have shown us repeatedly over and over of a world that is lost when you do not have a voice in the world. And Father, you have created the church to be your hands and your feet and your mouthpiece. Father, I pray that we would understand our task, that we could get beyond self, that, oh, we have such terrible trials, I know, but you're with us, and that you will bless us when we're faithful to you, and I pray that we could get beyond the muck and the mire of our own lives at times to see the bigger picture, that today you might be calling us to receive Jesus, and you may be knocking on the door of our heart to say, I want you to do this specific thing in your city, I want you to do this specific thing in your United States, I want you to do this specific thing, my servant, across the globe. You speak to us in so many different ways. I pray today that we would hear you. That we would be fascinated by the fact that you loved each of us enough to send your only son. What a sacrifice that is. What is sacrifice? Father, there's no way that we can outgive you. And we know that your blessings await us who are faithful when we respond to your voice and take that next step. We're never going to take that next step until we step out in faith. I pray today, if it's somebody's prayer to their, they need to say, Jesus, I love you. I receive you as Lord and Savior. Come into my life. That they could take that next step and pray that prayer. That they could take that next step of baptism to have their sins forgiven. That they could make, take that next step to sign up, to participate, to get involved, to get into the game. To see the purpose that you have for their life. Father, I pray that we hear your voice so clearly today that we could love you with all of our heart, our mind, and our strength that we might serve our neighbor as ourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you have a decision like that, would you stand with me right now? Uh, we would ask that if we could help you with that, pray with you about that, we can go pray with several of the, of the guys in the back. If we stand and as we sing and worship, make this a time of decision for your life. And if you just need to stand right where you're saying and say, Lord, I need to recommit my life to you, then you do that. You say that prayer today. You take that step today as we stand and sing.